Welcome to the first official podcast of the 2021 regular season. And you can see we have a little different format. I know you guys are tired of just looking at this mug. So we're going to have a lot of new things going on here from new content, better production value, more growth at our website and beyond. And yes, I have a co-host, or really host, where now I'm just the guest. <laughs> and so our host can do all the background work and everything, and I can just sit back and answer questions and uh, chill here. So I'd like to introduce and welcome Thomas Casali, who is Pro Football Doc, really Injury AI, our new media director, who will double as the host for the podcast already has a lot of great growth ideas and by the way don't contact me contact him at support at profootballdoc.com if you want a, a, a production job video production job a, a content job and other things he's the one that's hiring not me but Thomas is a very experienced person in the industry here and that's why we have brought him in and you'll see a lot of growth over the next month with what we're doing but we're starting with you right here as I'm calling you the host so that I can just relax relax so take it away tell everyone about yourself well thank you doc I'm excited to be here um, I have experience uh, I've worked at Roto Grinders uh, I used to work for the New England Patriots as a as a, a team reporter there and, and we talked we've had people in common from Rodney, Rodney Harrison, Harrison to yeah. Junior Sam yeah. to Lonnie Paxton. Yeah, Lonnie who, Paxton. Who's your hero and I my, my hero. I, I I wrote the best story I ever wrote was on Lonnie Paxton as a long snapper. It was a dream of mine to have kids who were long snappers. Now I got two. So it all worked out. <laughs> well, I'd say this small world, right? Lonnie Paxton, you've seen him on the podcast before. Long time New England Pages long snapper and uh, Tom Brady friend yep. off, uh, came in the league the same year as Tom Brady mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also an investor in, in yes. our company but more importantly I talked to Lonnie and said hey Thomas Casale you remember and he said who well, <laughs> yeah, no, I, he was, I'm joking and, I just and, and which I responded why don't you tell him I'm the only person who ever wrote a story on him maybe that <laughs> you know and there's not too many long snapping stories out there but no and I've worked for the score I was the managing editor of sports betting for the score and most recently BetQL and Odyssey uh, before coming here and uh, you know I'm excited to get started and we got a lot of great things ahead as Doc said all right, so uh, new format for the podcast, still on uh, all the usual places, uh, Apple and all the other different things, uh, and video as well. So at this point, I'm just going to sit yeah, back, well, you hey, take it away. Well, let's get, I mean, we're going to get to all the big injuries this week. Fitzpatrick, you know, Judy, all the big ones. But I think the biggest news of the week, you went 5 and all. Oh. I, I, on your week one, I, coming strong out of the gate, five and zero on your picks, uh, and that includes one of the great backdoor covers of all time, the Detroit Lions. Well, I will say this: first of all, you can say I went five and zero, and you can say I did. I live in California. I didn't make a dime. <laughs> we talked about setting up for Circa or Westgate, yep. but uh, you know the logistics and, and what have you. And I also want to stay legal and not get in any trouble. So no question, I published it ahead of time, and it's uh, in the Outkick article here that you see. And we publish this every Saturday night, Sunday morning, based on FanDuel lines. A Saturday night. Sometimes we have injury advantages where the lines move. Uh, we don't take that. We just look at Saturday night lines write the article and it's published by Sunday morning so it's out there so when I go 0 and 5 you can rip me for well, it. Well yeah but this isn't a fluke. What were you last year? 50, 30 and 1? 50, 30 and 5. And five. We did 5 so, games every Sunday morning really Saturday yep. night so 17 weeks do the math that's 85 so it's not made up it was vetted every week at OutKick 50, 30 and 5 is what we finished against the spread but here's the thing Thomas look you know schemes, you know players, mm -hmm. you know who the better teams are and better position players are, and you know matchups, right? And a lot of you, and most of you do too, what we're trying to do is not tell you guys what you should bet. 
we give you a tool based on injuries that you may not know in the analysis. So when you look at, for example, here, the Colts versus Seahawks, it was our strongest yep. game here. You look at the Seahawks, they're green. For, look at the numbers here. They're green. The Colts are in the yellow and it's week one. They have defensive issues, Xavier Rhodes with Kimiko Ture. Uh, and offensively, obviously, Eric Fisher isn't there. Uh, Quentin Nelson just coming back. Uh, Carson Wentz not 100%. No T.Y. Hilton. So that was just injury. I think the line takes care of itself in terms of uh, home field, away, weather conditions, coaching, scheme, player talent. But the injuries are the unforeseen potential advantages. Carolina was the other one. And if you look at it, Carolina was clearly the healthier side over the Jets. That got closer than it should have been. Uh, Carolina blew some opportunities. The lucky one was, and you were telling me here in the command center, I said, well, I mean, you all and, and Sports Grid was, were giving me grief about, yeah, tuck the lines. I said, look, I'm not picking based off personnel. Uh, I'm picking based off of injuries. Mm -hmm. And the injuries say the lines are the healthier side, and they were getting eight and a half. And boy, did that half point come in handy. You were saying keep the faith. It, yeah, it was, so. I was like, ah, this thing is it's not even rootable. They're down by 24, and they scored 16 yep. late late points. Maybe part of that, uh, you know, was uh, was uh, due to injuries and other things too. And then uh, Denver was pretty easy against yep. the Giants, one, once again based on injuries. And Rams were pretty easy against the Bears, once again. Yeah, based a on lot injuries. of those picks were easy, and I know. Um, and these are based on what we're calling six scores. We have uh, individual six scores. We have team six scores, and that's like Doc said. That's grading the health of the team, and that's how we're making the picks. We're not making them by line movement. We're not. It's purely the health of the team. And, and I, I even hesitate to say truly picks. I'm picking because look, the Westgate game, the Circuit game, it's five games, you know. So I'm trying to play along. But obviously, like I told you, I didn't even bet on any of them. So call me dumb. I mean, a five-team parlay would have been pretty, pretty nice or whatever. But my point is, it's a tool for you all. So if you already like the Seahawks against the Colts by scheme or by whatever, this gives you a reason to go harder. Right. If you liked the Colts, maybe it gives you pause to slow down. But even for fantasy and DFS, you can literally look at, uh, you know, the uh, Giants run defense or, you know, or the uh, Broncos pass offense health and figure out if Judy's a person to play or not, you know, and it's a tool for all of you. It's not a pick this, pick this, pick this. And and obviously, as prop values grow, yep. that's tremendous. And, and of course, the in-game market with what we do in-game. So that's kind of what we're about. Yeah, and we'll be talking about, we have a game tonight, Monday night, between uh, the Raiders and the Ravens. And we, we actually see a pretty big uh, edge health-wise in that matchup, which we'll be discussing a little bit later. But let's jump in. Everyone wants to know the big injuries. Let's talk about, I mean, as someone, I have uh, the Washington football team plus 260 to win the NFC East and uh, took a little bit of, blow, of a blow there in week one. Ryan Fitzpatrick injured on IR. What do you see in there, Doc? Well, my hope still is the IR is short-term IR, right? I mean, the rules are still different this year. Three weeks, and then you can come off. Unlimited number. So uh, is it going to be three weeks? Not sure. But I don't think it's season-ending unless we get bad news on the MRI. So in game, this is one of the ones that we talked about here. We tweeted out and said Ryan Fitzpatrick, we said is not coming back today before the official announcement. And we even went so far to say that he was not playing Thursday against the mm -hmm. Giants. Yep, right away, in, right away in game. And if you see, you know, this YouTube links and clicks, then you can see what we said in game with uh, with what was going on there. Uh, Etc. And the reason why we had confidence to say it is if you look at the video of the injury, which is what I do. Okay. So here we see it on the screen here. Fitzpatrick gets hit. And it doesn't look that bad at first, but I'll freeze it for you and show you when we play it again here what concerned me. He gets hit, but as he goes down right, a little bit further, right there. So he's got the defender on him, his hip flexed up and jamming. And this is why, look, one of the things that I try and do is I don't try and talk with hip joint models or here's 
anatomy lesson. You guys are football fans. You're not medical students. No, we don't care about that. Student students. So this is why I did not use the word hip subluxation. What I said was a Tua-like yep. injury, but not as severe, right? Tua had a hip dislocation, and indeed the reports of hip subluxation is a Tua-like injury, not as severe. So the key here is now, if he tore labrum, if he has a bone bruise, if he knocked off a piece of cartilage or a chip of bone, it's possible his season could be over. The hope is he did none of those things and can return. But it's Taylor Henneke's game yep. for, uh, for a, a little bit here. Uh, it's his Washington football team for this Thursday, as we said, for week three and week four. Um, then maybe week five in October, we'll see about uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. And I feel bad for him. Uh, I don't know him super well, but we've He's shared like a great guy. Well, we share some stories for, with the Crimson. So that's yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and, but you know, uh, just so people know out there in terms of betting, like, you know, Doc mentioned that he predicted right away Fitzpatrick was out for Thursday. Uh, the line opened at different shops between minus five and minus four and a half for Washington, and it's already down to minus four. So it's that kind of information, that half point, that full point there. If you you know if you like the Giants, you you could have gotten on that right away. Well, that's where you're going to be great, Thomas, because we last year did some uh, early line movers and we we're uh, videos and we we're okay predicting it, but. Gambling is not my world, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to get everything right. And so as you develop that side of the platform, I think the website is really, instead of buying points, you can lock things in earlier and get those points for free before the line moves. But that's something that will be developed and come over time. And let, let's move on to uh, it was a, it was a tough week for me because I have the I have Washington to win the NFC East and then I have uh, Jerry Judy on one of my big fantasy teams and a uh, high ankle sprain those are always tough. Um, what is your projection for Judy? Well, before we even get to Judy, let me throw in a tagline before it happens here. Antonio Gibson, I oh, think mm -hmm. he hurt his shoulder a little bit, but the good news is okay. Do not be surprised if later today, because it's a Thursday game, the first injury report comes he out, misses practice. and he misses practice or is limited. Look, it's possible the Washington football team list him as full because it's a walkthrough, and they'll say it's a walkthrough projected he's full. But he does, I think, have a left shoulder issue, left AC joint sprain, where if he's DNP or LP this week, I still think he makes the bell on Thursday, okay. maybe with an injection. So let me just put something that out there. Something to watch. Something to watch. Jerry Judy. Um, I was trying to deliver good news, and this one was kind of fun because on Jerry Judy, we're doing the halftime injury chat as you were here. It was a do on Twitter Live now since Periscope is dead. And as we're doing it here, we, chat, we actually uh, talk about... Uh, just went to we, 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 we're doing it live. And we don't catch all the games in the command center here at halftime. Mm -hmm. And on the big screen, Denver and New York was still playing. And as we're on, Jacob and Taylor was, oh, Jerry, Judy. And I'm looking at the screen. And we really did it live, saying high ankle sprain. We put out the post real quickly. And the Twitterverse was saying ankle fracture, ankle yep. fracture, ankle fracture. And, uh, yeah, it looked bad. But thankfully... Tom Pelissaro came to the rescue and said, X-rays negative, high ankle sprain. That's the good news. But the bad news is he's still going to be an IR. He's still going to miss multiple weeks. I think if I were a Broncos fan or a Jerry Judy fantasy owner or whatever, and you told me he'll be back by the end of October, I would say take it. That's a solid return. Okay. So he's got a chance to come back in October, but albeit late in October. It could extend to November, but a season should not be over. He should not need surgery, uh, et cetera. But it's a significant yeah. high ankle sprain. He's going to miss an extended period of time at this point in time. But at least the season is not over. That's kind of the only silver lining. All right, so there you have it, fantasy owners. Be prepared uh, to be without Jerry Judy uh, until at least Halloween. So. That's something uh, very, very tough news for Judy owners. Uh, one injury I, I found fascinating, I want to get into it with you, is Mikhail Becton for the Jets. All right, now he, he goes down, and 
okay, he's crying, right? He's it's all it's and, and everyone on Twitter is jumping on the emotional part of it. But you have something that I think is very important. You don't diagnose the reaction, the emotion. You diagnose the injury. So go into a little bit on Beckton. Look, uh, uh, I try. Look, I'm not trying to discount the emotion. Look, players are emotional because they care. Mm -hmm. So I feel for Makai Beckton. And I'm not discounting his emotion. I just don't judge the injury off the emotion. If players go and pat a guy on the back, I don't say, oh, they're telling him his season is done. If a cart is utilized, I don't tell him. Like, you saw live in our command center for the first time here, uh, T. Higgins. Yes. There was a report, they said, he went off in a cart. And we immediately went back to his last play and looked and said, don't see anything. Yeah, and I said it was cramped. I said, oh, he, he's taking him off for <laughs> yeah, cramps IV. and an IV. Yep. So the cart is also judging the reaction to the injury, yes. not the injury. And so it's like, and it was IV and, and cramps. So the fact that Makai Becton was carted off didn't necessarily change my mind. The fact that he was emotional didn't change my mind. It was the injury as he got rolled up that we said MCL. We did not have a second angle. It's my fault. I could have, but I try not to be speculative about what's else in addition to MCL. And it turns out it was a transient kneecap dislocation. But so far, good news. And we put out some video, et cetera. Yes, we talked about the possibility of surgery immediately. Yes, he is having surgery. But if there is such a thing, the good kind of surgery. Mm -hmm. Scope, removing loose chips not rebuilding the ligament so he has a he will come back this year he's going to be on ir uh, is it four weeks is it six weeks can't be sure somewhere in that range um remember patrick mahomes the year he won the super bowl dislocated his kneecap because yes. of his stretchy on ligaments the quarterback sneak there on the quarterback yep. sneak on thursday night right. football and he returned to play three and a half weeks later and won the Super Bowl that yeah. year and yeah. has yet to need any surgery. So this is actually a fairly minor surgery for Makai Becton, so that's good news. But he is going to miss some time, unfortunately, for the Jets. Yeah, and the Jets seem to be one of the team this year that's just snake bitten. It seems like every every day there's a, there's a new injury started in training camp in the preseason on the defensive side of the ball, which is why you liked Carolina this week. And now their top offensive lineman is out. So yeah, they had a lot of injuries on defense. Yeah. And and for me, I try not to say I like Carolina because it's a revenge game for Sam Darnold and Robbie Anderson. It was more based on the health. defensive yep. health uh, inefficiencies for the Jets. So let's go into somebody who's had injury issues in the past and. One I, I was surprised by, Raheem Moser, the running back for the 49ers. We watched the video. Um, I mean, we saw his last two runs. On his last play, he kind of went out for a pass. Didn't look like anything. Uh, you know, I thought he'd be back soon, but apparently more serious than that. Well, I mean, at least it's not an ACL, and yeah. all 49ers fans <laughs> will were last on that one. Unfortunately, Jason, Jason Rett wished he could say that mm -hmm. about himself. But in any case, the good and bad news. The good news it's not an ACL. The good news, by video, we didn't see a lot. Mm -hmm. The bad news, it seems to be reoccurring the issue. And so with that, uh, I don't see how they put Mostert out there again this week and have him leave the game early. It may be Trey Sermon time. They got to figure out how to get this right. So, I mean, look, one of the things, you know this having worked with the Patriots and, you know, for me, a team hates playing shorthanded. Yes. And if you lose a guy early, like roster spots and active jerseys are so valuable. Like, do you play eight offensive linemen? Do you get that spot for seven? This is why you don't have kickoff specialists in the mm -hmm. NFL. The roster spots are valuable. And if you go out early in a game, that's no bueno for the roster spots but also for special teams and backups and the intricacies. That's playing shorthanded, entering a, a fight shorthanded. Teams do not like that. So because of that, I think they're gonna have to take a little time out on Mostert to make sure that he can finish games before they suit him up again. Yeah, and you're big on those, uh, you know, that, that's a good point about like practice, when, when somebody's activated from the practice squad, that really plays into your analysis and you know, just, one of the things you said in week one, you know, and I, you mentioned it a few times, and the first time you said it, I didn't really understand what, didn't really get it, but you, you said Carson Wentz will start because of the <laughs> Sam Ellinger injury. 
and you said he's not 100%, but he'll start because you're not going to have an 85, 90% Carson Wentz as the backup quarterback. So you, you called that weeks ago. Yeah, look, uh, look, I know the docs in Indianapolis. I would not call them for information on Carson Wentz. They wouldn't tell me if I asked. That's insider information. The SEC will put you in jail for insider yeah. information. <laughs> But insider knowledge, he can make some money in the stock market. I'm dealing in insider knowledge when it comes to this. So what I was saying about Carson Wentz, and thanks for bringing that up, is given that bone excision surgery, I understand the five to 12 week timeline. I understand that Carson has healed quickly. I also understand because of his injury history, the Colts were saying, we're looking long term. That's why Jim Mercer said, we're not playing him until he's 100% which is why I then said he will not play week one. Mm -hmm. I was looking at early October. But what changed is the third string Sam Ellinger. Why, right? Because they just added Brett Hundley. No team wants to go into a season or a game with one healthy quarterback. I mean, you got to have two viable options. Hundley doesn't know the playbook at all. Right. Hundley doesn't know the playbook. And so with Ellinger out, what are their options? They start Eason and have Hundley, who doesn't know the playbook, the backup, can't yeah. do it. Have Carson Wentz dressed but not playing because he's in the 90s? Right. That's a bad look. That's why I said Carson will now start. And they did come. Frank Reich said, admitted he wasn't 100%. Uh, he said he was a full go, the playbook said, but he admitted so he wasn't 100%. Change. Things change. Things yeah, change because of the injury. But, you know... Um, with your friend slash Idolani Paxton, we talked about here in this room after Jared Goff got traded, and we sort of talked last year why Jared Goff had maybe fallen out of favor. I won't get into that now. We said, what about Jimmy G? I think they're hiding my health related to his high ankle. And Lonnie said, yeah, it's feasible. And a couple weeks later, the trade, number yeah. three, Trey Lance. And Insider knowledge is, I think, the unfair advantage that I have. Look, I think I, you know, I worked in the industry. I like studied film, and I worked with these guys. But I think it's reading the tea leaves in between what they're really signaling. Because remember, I was on the other side. Mm -hmm. Look, the world didn't know Philip Rivers had an ACL tear when he did, and he had the knee scope when we were playing the. Patriots. Patriots, and you were there with them, et cetera, so you still owe me one there. We know that Super Bowl. Look, if you guys were going to go to the Super Bowl, you could at least well, win it. And I will. You could have told year. LT to play. I didn't tell him to stand on the sidelines. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, we're going there. Okay, we're going there. Okay. We're, we'll say, I'll say my good rebuttal for for, for another time. Well, let I thought the surprise to me on Sunday was when uh, when Odell Beckham didn't play. I, th I thought he was going to play. I mean, I know you, you dinged him in that SIC score because because of his injury, but I, I think a lot of people were surprised that he was inactive. I was too, and I shouldn't have been, and here's why. I have even more respect for Odell than I had before. Okay, My history with Odell is very small. I met him one time at a Super Bowl party when he was young and he wouldn't remember me. And then this summer when he was tweeting pictures of how he was doing, I had a Twitter interchange with him and then subsequently DM'd. And I was being critical. I was saying, yeah, he looks good. He's right on track. But he's not anywhere close to there yeah. yet. Decel deceleration and cutting, he's not there yet. You can see it. And he agreed with me. And he was very respectful on Twitter and DMs, and I almost got him to come on the podcast, but you know, like I said, I don't know him very well, but very respectful. Now, I tweeted that he wasn't gonna be 100%. There was no way he would run the full route tree, but offensively, because he knows the route he's gonna run, as opposed to a DB who has to react, I thought he could play. And the social media signaling for the national reporters and beat reporters is it's going to be kind of up to Odell. And I'm like, I know how much Odell wants to win. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to leave it in the hands of an athlete, they're always going to lobby to play. Right. But when we were in here for West Coast 10 a.m. games, and there were reports that he's on the field without socks and shoes and doing something, I was like, oh, that sounds like he's with the inactives. 
And what's come out, I respect Odell even more. Yes, it was his decision, and he was saying, I'm not fully there. I can't do everything. I will be limited. I will be taking up a roster spot when I'm not full go. And so he was the bigger man to say, let's go. And going back to LT, that's kind of what LT was saying. I'm injured. Sure, I can go out there as a decoy in that Patriots game, AFC Championship game. But Michael Turner right now is better than better me. Than, yeah. So I'm going to be the bigger man and move aside. And that's what Odell Beckham did. So because of that, I really respect him even more. He's got this, I think, unfair reputation. Hothead, this, But that is some advanced thinking to say, no, the better move for my team is I'm not fully there to take a back seat, even though selfishly he wants to play. Yeah. So I respect that. And I can, I mean, you said right away when, when the video came out of him and his bare feet, you said he's not playing. Yeah. You, you, you did say that. But let me ask you just a question that I find interesting is you mentioned the video he posted, right? And whenever fans see a video of somebody who's come and, and they're just running, they should be weary of that, right? It's uh, because, like you said, it's not the cutting, it's not, I mean, it's not the acceleration. It's that's what needs to be, that's what teams need to see before they play, right? Okay. Does anyone post a bad Instagram or Facebook picture? Right, no. (laughs) Okay? I mean, you took seven pictures and you select the best one. Do you think these guys are just randomly posting all their videos? No, they're picking the best ones, what they did best at, and more power to them. But the other thing is, just because someone is running and doing very well, and like, be it Odell, be it Bud Dupree, who I, I didn't slam, but I was like, he's not 100% in videos. Look, this is the NFL. These guys are way up here mm-hmm. on a level. And, and the difference between great and just a guy is like this in the right. NFL. The game isn't that easy to say, oh, look at that video. He, he's not obviously limping. That's not good enough. And that's where the fine points come in. And so I don't mean to come off as being very negative on videos. I'm just looking at it with a more critical eye and trying to point out what I see and what the realities are in terms of what it is. But quite honestly, Thomas, it's out of the ultimate and utmost respect for the players and what they do at such a high level. I think we were going to talk about earlier, Taylor Lewan apologized yeah. because he gave up five sacks. Yeah. And I retweeted and say, look, he knows he wasn't 100%, yet he made it out there for his team and gave it his best try. You can't, I mean, I don't think the man has anything to apologize for. He came back very quickly from his ACL. There's no way he was 100%. And he got whooped by a top player, Chandler Jones. And yes, he gave up five sacks, but I I don't know. I I think that's great of Taylor Lewan to apologize, but... I don't think he owes anyone an apology. If anything, he took a risk of going out there at less than 100% in this league and made himself look bad when he could have just said, I'm not going. Yeah, I'm not playing. Well, one player you've been on all summer, um, you gave him a low six score this week um, and it proved to be correct, uh, Saquon Barkley. Let's talk about what you saw coming into this week and what you see going forward the next couple weeks. Well... Saquon is a great running back, and I didn't know whether he would play or not, but the pattern of clearing him on Friday does not, there's no way he's going to be 100%. Recovery from an ACL is not a light switch. It's a slow, slow sunrise. And so it's not, you can't do it this week or this day, and the next day all of a sudden you can't. And that's always saying, hinting all week, all weekend, under yards, under mm-hmm. carries. There's no way he's going to get 20. And I think that it was 12 and a half or 13, I don't know, the prop bet, whatever it was. Now, could a game script get away from someone and, and maybe more? It's possible. But there's no way they're planning that. And I think, what was he, Jacob? 10 carries? 10 carries, 26, one catch per yard. One catch per yard, 10 carries, 26 yards. Okay. Saquon is a great athlete, and he's a bona fide NFL running back. But this Sunday, he was a guy. He yeah. wasn't Saquon, and you can see his de- cuts are not definitive. Look, will he play next week? I'm sure he will. Barring, well, I don't know, actually, because it's a Thursday quick turnaround. 
depending on what happens, it's possible Saquon doesn't play this thir- this Thursday against Washington football team. But that doesn't mean setback. That's just too quick of a turnaround yeah. coming off of, of a knee. So there, we'll we'll talk about that. But that's uh, he may not play because it's a Thursday game. But he'll play week three and he'll gradually ramp up. But not really for him to be Saquon. You're looking at second half of the season, and that's what we've been saying all along. Yeah, and. Um and, and that's what I told you when I first started here. I said, one thing I'm taking from you is I'm not going to take Saquon Barkley in the first round of a fantasy draft because you're saying, you know, October at best he's going to be, so you're losing a lot of, you know, a lot of fantasy points. There's no question when I had some later first round picks in the fantasy draft, I was like, please don't fall to me. Please right. don't but fall you're to saying, me. I need another option. But you're also saying, listen, if he starts the year off slowly, maybe mid-October, you want to trade for him. Right? Well, it maybe it towards, maybe he starts hitting his stride in the last couple months. Well, one of the things, and I get a great kick out of this, Thomas, all the time. One of the best comments I get, and I, and I appreciate it, you guys, is when I get direct tweets or messages from people that say, you're great, you helped me win my fantasy league, but I don't tell my teammates. Yeah, right. They don't, they <laughs> don't, they don't want to watch it. They don't want to know. So they want to <laughs> fleece that trade late season for Saquon. Okay. But now, before we get to the rundown, Doc, there's a situation I want to look at because I think it has multiple layers. So first of all, I'm going to call it right now on the podcast. Um, the Bears will have a new starting quarterback next week. Uh, that will be the rookie, Justin Fields. Um, and here's why, because we're going to talk about the left tackle situation, which is absolutely just uh, injuries all over the place. And I don't think they can let Andy Dalton sit there and just get hammered on like he did against the Rams. Tell, let, tell me what you think about that left tackle situation for the Bears and, and how that looks for the rest of the season, especially if there is a rookie quarterback. Well, look, we talked about it last night on the on the, and, and Twitter and other during the game. They started in the field view with the left tackle, the, the young guy, out on IR with a back issue. Jason Peters was called off a fishing trip yep. <laughs> and two weeks later is in the NFL. And Jason Peters has had a great career. Career, but he's but not Jason Peters. Anymore. He's not Jason Peters of old. He's, you know, he's, he's old. Mm-hmm. And to come off the street or a fishing trip two weeks ago is asking a lot. Then he hurts his quad here. And then his replacement gets rolled up on and leaves. So even in game at the end, I was like, you can't have Andy Dalton sit back there mm-hmm. on standard first read, second read, third read routes. You got to get the ball out of the hand, either quick passes. And I think that's what you're saying, it's Justin Fields. I'm not so sure that they're going. I think clearly, if the Bears are smart, they have to find a solution at left tackle, which will be hard. Yeah, they can chip, they can change protection and so forth. But they're going to have to call plays to have Andy Dalton get the ball of his hand more quickly. This may mean Justin Fields gets more snaps because of his RPO stuff and his style. And I'll give you that. But I don't believe, and we'll have a friendly wager on this, that Justin Fields is the week two starter. Here's Coaches why. get fired in the NFL. And Matt, Matt, Nagy better do something soon or he's going to be gone at the end of the year. Can't that is the true. <laughs> they are playing the Bengals. We can't be seen. <laughs> well, yeah, but, the, but the Bengals have an underrated front seven, um, yes. you know. So if they can get pressure, uh, but don't you, Doc? Wouldn't you say that is a good though game to get Justin Fields in there, even if it's like you said more? It, okay, we get it. it they didn't want him to start against the Rams because of that defensive line. But this feels like the type of week, if you're going to go with the young quarterback, it's got to be sooner rather than later. I'll go halfway. I'll bet you a coffee or, <laughs> or lunch uh, or whatever that Andy Dalton is still the starter Okay. week one, week two. But I agree with you, there will be a lot more Justin Fields okay. in the game. But I don't think... He's going to, and here's my logic. Matt Nagy needs to win to move on. He clearly has hitched his wagon to Andy Dalton. Justin Fields, as he emerges, will get more time. But I don't think he can just this early, boom, switch. It would show a lack of confidence in his offensive line. It would show a lack of resolve when he tells a player, you're my guy, and switch off in a week. That's a locker room killer. So even if it's for face value for Matt Nagy, 
he's going to need to start Andy Dalton, even if Justin Fields plays 51% of the plays, he's going to start Andy Dalton. Okay. I That's would argue the thought. locker room wants Justin Fields, but we'll see. <laughs> 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 Detroit week four, so that... Okay, yeah, so you're starting to get into a yeah, situation, if you're going to play him, this would probably be a good time to start. I agree with you, but too early. Okay. But, but this offensive line issue is an additional push. Okay. Right? I agree with you there. But I don't think it's going to be enough. It's going to, well, he's going well, to get a lot of touches. You're lucky I only eat sandwiches and subs, so lunch won't be that expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, you ready to get into the rundown? Yeah, let's do it. All right, Pro Football Doc Podcast rundown here, which we always do. And like I said, the best part is I used to be, you know, Jacob and, and Taylor and everyone would do it also for me. But now I can just sit back and you fire away at the questions and, and we're good. All right, so, you know, there, there wasn't too much at quarterback, you know. Other than Fitz. Other than Fitz. And Wentz will get better. Wentz, yeah, a little better. We talked. I think there were a couple times that Wentz wasn't as escapable as is usual. Mm -hmm. um, and he'll get better. And Quentin Neslin will get better, too. But go ahead. Um, at, at running back, not a ton. We have, uh, you know, Rashad Penny, Calf. He always seems to be injured. I'm thrilled that the San Diego State guy's on the field. Look, like, he's been through a lot, yeah. right, and multiple surgeries. So uh, the calf is going to linger a little bit. Don't be surprised if he has an IR stint. If his knee's not 100% and he's got a calf and calves linger, if they need the roster spot, he'll be down for the three weeks. But at least he's out there, which is good news. We covered Antonio Gibson a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think he'll play, but don't be scared when he's limited this week in practice. What about Josh Jacobs heading into Monday night? He's got an illness. It's a question. I know that's that's kind of harder to to diagnose, but you think we see him Monday night? Well, I mean, uh, as long as he doesn't test positive for COVID, I think we'll see him. Look, they'll pump him full of IVs and a treatment. It's a it's a, a rules thing that if you're ill, that you have to be reported. But look, they still have Kenyon Drake, and uh, we'll get into it at the end there. But I don't think this. Uh, changes our thoughts related to the Monday Night Football game that we'll wrap up at the end. Okay, what about uh, moving a receiver now? Uh, one of the bigger injuries over the week was on Thursday, Michael Gallup for the Cowboys. I mean, they're deep at that position, but, you know, he does do a lot uh, for that team, especially uh, with the long passes down the field. How, how do you see that? Does that change their offense at, at all, or do you think that's just more C.D. Lamb? Well, I mean, a lot of C.D. Lamb, and I love C.D. Lamb this year. And, and the good news is Amari looked pretty good, mm -hmm. right? I was a little more down on Amari coming into the season, and he actually looked pretty good. And obviously, going back to quarterbacks, Dak performed very well. Let's very talk well. about that. Okay. Let's, let's, <laughs> I was looking for a segue, so let's, let, let's talk about it here because we know Gallup's out a couple weeks. So we're watching the game in the control room, right? And everybody on Twitter is raving about Dak. And out of nowhere, you say, you know, I, I don't know. Dak doesn't look 100% healthy to me. And you were saying you didn't think he was pushing the ball down the field as well. And at first, I thought you were crazy. I'll be honest. <laughs> I, I disagreed with him 100%. But, but you said it with an inside voice. Yeah. Since so you're I, I didn't say it, I, but I was like, what's he, what's he talking about? But then you changed my mind because you, you showed me the passing chart. And you showed me where Dak's completions were and where his incompletions were. And all his incompletions were to the outside, down the field, and it kind of proved your point that maybe he's at 90, 85, 90 percent. And I think the conclusion you came to is, in a couple weeks, Dak's going to be even better than he was on Thursday. Look, he was very successful, but remember, I'm judging how they move in the injury. Mm -hmm. I'm judging what he does as he is moving. I'm judging his mechanics as he throws the pass. I'm judging where the pass goes, the spiral, where he's pushing the ball downfield and stepping in the throws. I'm not judging if it's a circus catch or it's an interception. Uh, the result of the pass is less important to me. And that's why I said he's not fully there yet, which means he could have a tremendous upside. Now, you've been very kind in saying you're right, you're right, you're right. But for that Thursday, and I don't mind being wrong, for that Thursday game, the injuries on our website indicated Tampa mm -hmm. should have been yes. able to cover. And they didn't. And our injury side said it should have been a Tampa and under hint at. Mm -hmm. Of course, make your own decisions. Clearly, that's not where it ended up. But if you really think about it, 
Dak had a better than expected game. Certainly better than expected result. 400 plus yards passing, yeah. 403 or something. Yeah. But he threw the ball 58 times, so it wasn't like his yards per pass were super high. And he had, what, three touchdowns three or touchdowns something? touchdowns and one pick. One pick. So he had a very good game. But there were, and, and you'll help us do this, we'll pull out the video of the three or four times when he pushed the ball down the field and he didn't look very good at all mm -hmm. uh, in completions. And the, yard, the number of times he passed got him up there. But here's the other thing. It was a close game in the end. And the Bucks didn't cover. But how often does a team that's minus three in turnovers win a game? Single digits. It's like eight or nine percent of the time through the history of the NFL. Plus three on turnovers is the is the deal. And if you're if you're plus three on turnovers, the Cowboys were supposed to win that game. They gave up. They they got ten, two turnovers in the first half for ten points inside the, the deep in Chiefs territory, and the Godwin turnover in the second half. If you're anywhere close, it's just one turnover differential. I think the Bucks cover, and if it's not early, then it's maybe the under. This is why the ball's not round. We're not perfect, and we like pointing that out. But I still think that Dak isn't fully there yet. So for Cowboys fans, there's still upside. Okay, well, Christian's over there giving us the Grammys. Uh, well, I'm, just, I'm, 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 I'm letting you know no, I the reference to what we did last year. We are yeah, at the link no, the last podcast. The, let's, let's hit a couple more players, and then we'll get into the Monday night game. Um, uh, Trent Brown, calf injury. Uh, uh, what do you see in there? Well, they linger, so that, that may be a big deal for the Patriots, Trent Brown's calf injury. Jedrick, look. If I were look, everyone on Twitter verse would seem to be more worried about Jedrick Willis, the left mm -hmm. tackle of the uh, Cleveland Browns, than about Trent Brown. But I'll make you this soft wager: Jedrick Willis comes back before Trent Brown does. Okay. Okay. I, I, Jedrick Willis has a chance next week. I don't see uh, uh, Trent Brown with the calf because it can linger, it can re-aggravate, and once again, you can't run him out there, start him at left tackle in the first series, he's out, and now you're short. You can't, unless you're trying to carry nine offensive linemen or something, uh, I don't, I think that's where they're at. Okay, and one one more player before we uh, move on I want to get your thoughts on is uh, Bradley Chubb for the Broncos. I, I mean, the defense, that uh, team's interesting because uh, they uh, had a good week one performance. Defense played well, but Chubb not there. Uh, when do you think he'll return? I think he's close. He's on the verge. So uh, any minute could be this next week. And the other big one that's not so good, of course, is uh, it's been confirmed now, Jeff Okuda yes. with the Achilles. And we said yesterday, that happened off camera, so we couldn't make the call. But Achilles fits an off-screen away from the ball, change of direction injury, as we posted. The on-field exam was very clear, and the lines already know. It's been confirmed. And the cart use at the end makes sense here. And unfortunately, he had not the greatest game in the world, and you saw the, his, his coach berating him a little bit. The, the number three pick. Uh, here's the bad news. Not only is this season done, but for a DB, for a corner, mm -hmm. It's not guaranteed he's 100% to start next year. So this is a big deal for Jeff Akuda. so we feel for him. Okay, well, that's the rundown of, I, mean, I think we hit most of the big injuries from this week. Let's move on to Monday night's game, because I think this one's going to be interesting. The, the Ravens play at the Raiders, right? The Ravens minus four, four and a half point favorites. But in terms of just team health, we see a pretty big advantage for the Raiders on the sixth. Well, court. if you look on the screen here, right? I mean, the Ravens, you, obviously, the running backs, and soon we'll have an additional feature to show how bad the running backs are. It's not just the starter, mm -hmm. Dobbins. It's it, the depth. It's the depth. I mean, no Dobbins, no Gus Edwards, no uh, Justice Hill. Obviously, they signed Latavius Murray. Uh, Rashard Bateman is out, but the Vegas team, Las Vegas Raiders, are healthy. And if you flip to the other side here. You can see, uh, obviously, no Richie Incognito for the Raiders and Josh Jacobs with an illness, but Kenyon Drake is a, a very, uh, uh, they're probably sharing duties anyways. But Derek Wolf, Jimmy Smith, and of course, Marcus Peters is out for the year with an ACL. So you can see the scores. There's a clear 17.1.6 score advantage out of 100 going to the Raiders. They're at home, they're getting points, they're playing in front of a crowd, inaugurating a new stadium. 
look, you can talk scheme, you can talk this, that, the other. Maybe Lamar will go crazy, but we just deal in injuries. We feel like there's an advantage here in, uh, in terms of the unseen advantage for the Raiders here based on injury alone. Yeah, that sounds like the Raiders' money line to me, so plus 164, uh, I think I'll give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't blame me if not. So one of the things I'll tell you we always end with, and we'll end with this a little video analysis. So we showed you Ryan Fitzpatrick's uh, injury, and we'll show you again here where on the screen here where he is. That right hip, okay? Now, let's go to Tua, and this is why I called it a mini Tua injury. Mm -hmm. This is from college, Tua here. He rolls out. Watch how he gets his hip caught under him in similar fashion. Yeah, moves away. Same way. Yeah. About the same. And you can actually, right here, you see it. That right hip is caught up flexed with two guys on him. And that is why I said this was a Tua-like injury, but not as bad. And it's kind of working out. So to me, judging video of the injury is way better than judging the reaction of the video of the injury. Because look, in Ryan Fitzpatrick's case, what did he do? He got up, he walked off, he patted Taylor Henneke, on the butt, gave him a thumbs up, and walked into the locker room like it was nothing. Mm -hmm. Yet he's going to be on IR and had a significant hit. Injury. Right. So that that's kind of what we talk about. Okay. Well, that's it for the first podcast of the season. How do you? What, what do you think? The uh, other than you're stabbing me, you're high. No, just, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just joking. We banter around all yeah. the time. It's all good. All right. Well, we'll see you next week for the week two injury recap. Uh, that's uh, Doctor David Chow and Thomas Casali. Have a good week.